hating on Minecraft is incredibly popular right now, so I figured instead, why not watch an hour long video about why it's the best? Because in 1985, Nintendo launched the Super Mario Bros, a simple 2D platformer with an 8x8 pixel plumber who would later become the mascot of not just their games, but their consoles as well. Sega responded with Alex the Kid, and other companies would try Bubsy, Punky Skunk, and Rocket Rodent, but none of those have the staying power of the original, a character who is so iconic he's not just the face of Japan, but arguably of gaming as a whole. We have perhaps just one opportunity per generation for a game that can define so many's childhoods, and it looks like for this one we've decided on a game where you immediately are confused by the cows, have to chop down a tree after some confusion, and then build the world's worst looking base in a forest clearing, but yet this being so successful is something that raises the question of what makes it so special. We take for granted that it is an unfathomably popular and successful game, but what does Minecraft do so differently? That is the question I'm going to be attempting to answer today, and I think it's worth starting, like with any good question, with how this all came about and the early history. Mojang is not a normally run company, and honestly never has been, and the reason as to why can perhaps best be found by looking into the history of this company. Mojang Specifications was founded in 2009 by Notch after he was fired from his previous job at King solely because he was working on games in his free time. He took this as an opportunity to hire friends from the industry, but ran the company in a distinctly different way to it. Against all traditional wisdom, for example, Minecraft was never listed on Steam or any other platform, but in instead sold directly via its own websites. The company did get huge finance offers early on after its rise and success, but they were all refused, and after Minecraft started selling really well, millions of the company's profits were shared directly with the employees. Whether these things helped or hindered, they showed a massively different attitude towards game development that seemingly paid off for the company as the game went from success to success before it even officially released, as it was also one of the first games to allow users to play the game while it was being developed. In fact, they gave you a discount for doing so, and this is when many of you, myself included, would have first played and gotten into Minecraft, and it was during this early development of Minecraft that many of the best features of the game that people recognize to this day came to it. In fact, usually when a big popular game comes out, you can describe it as a clone of another one, but despite the fact that Minecraft is very admittant of taking a lot of its inspiration from Infaminer, the differences between that game and this one were so huge even by by the time it had finished beta, that at this point I don't think there is any comparison to be made, and so a part of why this can be described as true comes down to the tech. The very first time the general public got to lay eyes on Minecraft was in 2009 with the launch of a tech demo for something called Cave Game. Usually the earliest public prototypes for a game are there to show off some of the mechanics for it, or to focus on the potential graphical capabilities, almost to be an ad for the game, and so when you look at games like Super Mario 64 or Super Mario Sunshine, the earliest versions of these look fairly similar to the end one, even when they're there to promote something, it's there to promote the power of it, whereas Cave Game is a very different case because instead it was just a very small world of 256 by 256 blocks, and all of those were either grass or stone. Both of these textures are very basic, and they look very different to right now, because they were just borrowed from another project Notch was working on, called Ruby Dung. So the game is very bad looking, it's in a very small world, and also there's no real purpose to it. What is the actual demo being shown off here? Well, the really impressive thing about this is how the game is rendering 4.19 million blocks, and managing to render them in in just 20 seconds, while also having these complicated yet explorable caves that generate below it. All of these are randomly generated, and so Minecraft, or rather Cave Game, is effectively generating this entire world in that time, in the process creating an engine for a genre of game that didn't exist yet, and doing it in just eight days. To be fair, it's not to say that there was no Minecraft-style games before, but the closest inspiration you could really label was Infaminer, which was a multiplayer block-based game which encouraged destruction and competition, whereas this earliest version of Cave Game was clearly about creating realistic terrain which you would then explore, I mean the caves are literally a big part of the name, and also within just a few days more blocks were added and one of the very first and earliest goals of the game was to build on top of it. The game had effectively become a 3D canvas and this made it more like an art tool than like a video game. One of the delights that is to be found in reading old forum posts from Source and other places is that many people will just decide to give this random guy notches 
game a try, and once they do so, they decide to build something and they really enjoy it. There is this clear lightning which is being captured, and this is something which inspired Notch to not just spend a few more days, but an entire month working on the game, at which point the game was renamed into Minecraft, which ended its classic phase of development. This is the part of the story where Minecraft really starts to explode, and it's the part of the story that many official Mojang sources will cite as being the real beginning of Minecraft. Even the 15 year anniversary they did recently had a map where they shared this to be the very earliest versions of the game, but obviously to get to the point of being Minecraft classic, to get to being that free browser based game, which many people are still playing now, it had to go through a lot of rough edges, and being able to see those is one of the great things about Minecraft. Unlike with every other game where you just have to hear about stories here or there, with Minecraft you can genuinely just download all of these old versions and trace for yourself the lineage from classic to modern day Minecraft, every single update in between has been preserved, and even crazier than that is the fact that you can trace cave game up to classic, and this has an interesting tale in my opinion. So mobs are one of the things that really define Minecraft away from cave game, it's one of the things that makes it feel more like classic and less like a cave game you might say, uh, that's because they have a lot of complexity to them with animations, textures, models, etc. And so you might assume that the first mob added was something like the creeper, something that iconic. However, the very first mob added to Minecraft was actually the human and was found in the cave game prototype. You could summon it with the G key on your keyboard. And even more interesting, this is something that has only been found out recently, because Minecraft uh, in the pre-classic phase didn't have many players, there are all sorts of pieces of mission that are just missing. Some of this is versions of the game, and some of it is stuff like these characters. They were designed by an artist named Doc, and if you check the Minecraft wiki, they'll just be called uh, Black Steve, Rana, and uh, indeed Steve himself. However, interestingly enough, these were never actually named. The names seem to have come from somewhere on the internet, which seems to have an original source on a maybe questionable IRC server, but basically we do not know the name of these characters, and I think it's crazy that a game as big as Minecraft still has this hole in its early development where we still don't 100% know. There is one man who definitely knows for sure, but he doesn't own Minecraft anymore, and so now there is this big mystery about this early version of the game, and all of these questions about, did it intend to be a creative game first? Was survival a fun coincidence? Who knows for sure? All we know is that after Classic ended, survival was one of the first things added back into the game. Catching lightning in a bottle is rare, creating something that really connects with people is rarer yet, and yet with the case of Minecraft, not really said, I've made something people love, but screw it, I'm gonna try again, and that's precisely what he did when he tried to make survival Minecraft. This was additionally a bonus thing on top of the classic Minecraft, which was always available for free on his website, and fun fact, uh, Minecraft a few years ago actually re-put on their website, classic.minecraft.com, you can play it without owning Minecraft, just as you could all of those years ago, but Notch reckoned that he could convince people to pay for updates to a survival version of the game. This sounds like insanity on the surface, because who would want to pay to make a harder version of a game? Uh, but actually, this is the trend we see in the Minecraft community even now. You could play the game on peaceful, outside of the very few uh, situations where you could switch to easy. You could play with keep inventory on and all of the other easy assists, but more people are fascinated by hardcore. More people are fascinated by the idea of challenges that take away even more than this, like super flat survival or one chunk, and I think more people are fascinated by the idea of taking extra precautions and going through more work to make a more challenging survival Minecraft. In a game that is ultimately about artistic expression, we always find ways to put our own difficulty on top of it, and one of the things that happened during survival development is the game got more and more challenging, and yet it became more and more popular. An interesting fact about this is the it used to be a 256 by 256 by 64 world, which was entirely fine. The limited world is a classic part of the Minecraft experience. Uh, obviously, Pocket Edition started with the exact same world and had it for a very long time, and Console Edition had a similarly limited world, although about three to ten times bigger on each of the dimensions, but this is something which is important to say because one of the crazy steps made in early Minecraft development was the decision to make worlds infinite. I say infinite, you're really talking about 13 million blocks in a given direction, but they went from having a 256 by 256 world to having 
one which was about 26 million by 26 million blocks. That is a very big increase to say the least, and one of the crazy technical things about it is that it shouldn't be possible. To store that many blocks should take absolute terabytes of your hard drive, it shouldn't be able to run in a simple game that would go viral, so how did they do it? Well, they took advantage of the fact that you didn't actually need to load an entire infinite world because most players weren't going to use it. Instead, the game just loaded in any chunks that you happen to interact with, or any chunks that you walked through, and if you want the other sides of that, and this was enough for it to therefore create a world that felt infinite, but was really generating those chunks on the fly using your world seed. This world seed would change over time and accidentally gave the game, uh, you know, legs to have worlds that would continue over multiple updates, because as those updates would come out, your world wouldn't know how to generate 1. Point, uh, say 15 chunks anymore after 1.16 comes out, it wouldn't know how to generate 0.5 uh, chunks after 0.6 comes out. Minecraft just knows what the current generation should be, and so any new chunks are made in that way. But the other clever thing about this is on the file size, what should take terabytes of uh, storage can be fit into just 0.6 megabytes, and this is because of the fact that when Minecraft gave people infinite worlds, they realized the key point of human psychology, which was that even if you give people infinite, most people don't really want it, right? Uh, you know, it's like how uh, you can say to anyone, like, oh, you could technically become an astronaut, but how many people are? It's something about the freedom to do something, which inspires much more people than actually wanting to do it, and so you give people an infinite world, and most people stay within a few thousand blocks of spawn, meaning that the world sizes rarely went into the dozens of megabytes, let alone the hundreds, and much below the theoretical max world file size. There are some crazy players that have gone millions of blocks out there, and if they had, I'm sure nothing terrible would happen. And socialism slash commun- I would say socialism and communism aren't the same thing or even similar things, but let's just say they are for now. Oh no, no! So giving players infinite worlds really just meant giving players as much world as they wanted, and this helped players to focus on the other parts of the game, which it would then start adding during the early alpha and beta phases. Small features would be added each and every update, but this would slowly create the core mechanics of the game we know today. Uh, a small update might add minecarts, another one might add beds. This is the first time I started playing, but eventually we got more and more of the featured survival Minecraft that felt like it had real end goals for you to achieve. Having access to all of the blocks in the game was great, and being able to just build whatever you wanted, whenever you wanted, was wonderful too, but even more wonderful than that was the idea of actually slowly but surely building something meaningful, and that is what Survival Minecraft did. There are so many great things about the game that I'd love to talk about. It could make its whole own video, but how about we make it a very short segment in this one instead. Here are 10 unique things I love about Minecraft. I'm gonna start with the jukebox, because when you first listen to a song, you think it's cutesy and fun, but then you realize that they keep adding new discs all of the time, and by itself that makes something that is great. Oh yeah, love pig step. Also love other side, has to be said, and indeed all of the new discs from 1.21, but I also love the enchanting and how much fun you can have, uh, because depending on the number of bookshelves around your enchantment table, you'll either get level 1 enchantments like I would over here, or you can get level 30 enchantments as I would over here. Just this slight difference that comes from having more books means you actually have to put some thought into enchanting, and it makes a real fun part of a base. A lot of people do make these giant houses and then work out what to fill them with later, but I think one of the places I will always make space for is an enchantment room which is why I've done precisely that. But what I've also done is made various transport methods around my world. I love basically all of them. Flying around with an Elytra is so satisfying. Being able to go all the way around your world just like this, super great and fun. But I also love jumping on a minecart, which is why I have a big rail right there. Very, very glad I had the Elytra to catch me there. But also it's fun to breed horses and try and get the best one that you can. Wow, let me show you how great breeding horses is. By flying across my world, I love transportation in Minecraft, and maybe this is like my inner, uh, you know, like train, uh, you know, enthusiast coming out right here, but I love that there is so much variety to each of them that you could really design your entire world around it, as I sort of have with this, my horse speed and horse jump height tester, and this, the place where I politely keep my horses until I need to train them. Honestly, they've all been in here for years at this point. Might be animal cruelty to some, but you know, I bet this donkey's so excited that I'm finally gonna give him a ride. 
It's not a donkey, is it? I'm pretty sure it's a mule. Yep, it's a mule. <laughs> the fact that mules even exist in Minecraft to begin with, absolutely beautiful. Speaking of beautiful, I think that the new caves go about saying as being one of the best things Minecraft has done in forever. The thing that made me first start playing was the tiny cutesy caves they used to have. And now after seeing these, I wonder how I used to do it. But the truth is these are just so much better in almost every conceivable way. But you know what else is better? The amount of food we have right now compared to before. There are so many food choices. Rotten flesh still exists and all of the basic above surface foods do. But if you want biome specific food, there's glow berries in the lush caves. There's the watermelon in the <laughs> jungles. Every time I say the word watermelon, I'm just reminded of that stupid recipe where you can stitch nine of them back together into a melon. But there are so many food recipes in current day Minecraft that when people ask for more, they forget how spoiled we really are for it in a way that I think is beautiful. Speaking just on the pure joy that they bring me and have brought me while using them in Minecraft, I think farming is great. I think it's this great in fact, and I think that farming actual crops is wonderful, but so too is farming basically anything else. I think that there is just a primal joy that you get from seeing the number of resources you have go up, and using those resources to get you more resources, or ancient dinosaurs or bees, is just something that is always such a please. Number four on the list is villager trading. I love that they all have their own professions. I love that you can do whatever you want with the villagers to try and get their levels to the max. And I love that when you do so, you're rewarded with some very, very solid traits. Take me, for example. I've got a couple of villagers hanging out here that will actively give me golden carrots if I just hang out here long enough. I think that's a good deal. What about you? Maybe this guy disagrees. But, you know, what does he know? He's only tra trading glistening melons to me. I love that you can mass farm villagers, and I love that there are no ethical concerns about keeping them all locked up in cages all the time. I also love the sheer unadulterated joy that you get when riding on a blue ice boat. Seriously, this is one of the most enjoyable ways to do anything in this game. If you haven't got one yet, you probably need to. But also, the endless gameplay would have to be the second one. I love the... Yeah, it's, it's funny place to say endless gameplay. Uh, but I love that there is so many choices that you'll always have things in your world that you're not quite finished with. Take me, for example. You know, I'm a, a particularly bad example. But take me, for example. I was building a cherry grove biome in this little uh, corner where two tunnels meet. And I still am intending to build those things. I've got a shulker box full and ready to go. And I'll eventually get round to it but I'm going to be honest, I'm procrastinating that a little bit. So instead, take a look at my lovely trees that I made and my <laughs> ridiculous biomes that I'm always placing instead because there is no end to the amount of stuff that you can build. And I love that no matter how much you might feel, like, yeah, unlike uh, with most games where you feel like you're just building a to-do list, I feel like my to-do list is getting easier the longer I put it off. Because of progression increases, Minecraft is always allowing you to become more and more powerful. Some of the ideas that I thought were impossible before have become more possible, not just because some new items have unlocked or I've unlocked those items, uh, but instead because of the fact that actively Minecraft is changing and so too are my abilities at it. You know, that's a bit of a corny item to come last. So how about I say glass? I like that you can see through it and I like that when you're on the other side of it, you can see through it that way too. Wow, that's crazy. I also like that you can see an end portal through glass and it mostly makes sense. Oh, it actually is fixed, never mind. Picked, a, picked an old bug to pick on right there. So I went through an end gateway and it spawned me onto this island, which without any blocks, I am going to be stuck on for quite some time. So how about we talk not about the end full gameplay, but instead the endless gameplay that makes up Minecraft. If we cast our minds back to the early 2010s when Minecraft hit the scene, the dominant consoles were the Xbox 360 and the PlayStation 3, and most games were made to come out for these consoles specifically, and they deliberately would have very short focused stories. The gameplay would have a start, and it would have an end, and maybe a multiplayer too if you were lucky. RPGs and MMOs would generally allow for endless gameplay, and my thousands of hours grinding for 99 capes on RuneScape will tell you that they absolutely work, but with Minecraft this came to a whole new genre, and while sandbox style games has existed before, one where you could truly do as much as you wanted with no end state hadn't truly been conceived. Even when the game did add an official end in its full release, yep, this is the full release. <laughs> Thank you. 
It still consisted of going to a new dimension and killing a dragon. By the way, this is the last of her species, the only one in the world, and she drops an egg so she was actually pregnant. You kill a pregnant single mother and commit a genocide in one swoop. You get this beautiful poem which rewards you for doing that, but then you're immediately teleported back to the overworld. And then the game basically asks you, what are you going to do next? To be fair, the end itself was later turned from a singular boss fight into the actual beginning of a new dimension where you can unlock wings, better storage, and new blocks. But the point is that Minecraft is always asking you, what do you want to do next? And it's providing an unlimited amount of gameplay for you to do so. This is very much in stark contrast to the traditional thinking of the games industry at the time, where basically every game was on a quest to say, okay, when can we end this game so that people will start buying the DLC or the sequel or working on the next thing that we want. And the only games that were permitted to be endless were multiplayer ones. And even then the breadth of actual updates were rare. Rather than the games industry trying to get you done with a product so you can buy the next one or buy the DLC for this one, Minecraft did the exact opposite tact and started releasing free updates on a very regular basis and this allowed players to consistently get new content without having to pay. This sounds like insanity from the broader games industry view because why is it that you would update this game that you don't even sell for full price and continue to give people new features when they'd probably happily pay for them but the answer is in the growth that we saw in Minecraft. It became the best selling game of all time and ultimately made much more money than it ever would have if after 1.0 came out they started selling each of their successive updates that they spent lots of development time on as expansion packs. 1.1, 1.2, 1.3 you could have all been individual pieces of DLC and they probably would have made millions from doing so given the player base of Minecraft at the time but by not doing so they made hundreds of millions and this is the genius of Minecraft. Giving stuff away for free is actually a smart way to make money and that is a very bizarre our business move that has worked out for them but one of the things about these updates that has been so successful is releasing them regularly and so Minecraft updates have started to standardize. For better or for worse now almost every update includes two to three new mobs, a new structure and some new blocks which will have their own character to allow you to build new things. In other words some new things to survive against, some new things to look for for adventurers and some new things to build with if all you want to do is that and out of these three my personal favorite has to be the structures which to talk about briefly they bring a sense of similarity to worlds that are otherwise always different. Minecraft terrain is infinite and random based on the seed, which means that no two worlds should ever have anything in common really, but yet because of fairly rigid biome generation, and even more importantly, because of exactly strict structure generation, you will find the same desert temple on two separate deserts, almost guaranteed, and it will almost act as the bridge between worlds. There are some features which are the same across all Minecraft worlds, and even when they changed bit to bit from Minecraft seed to Minecraft seed, like with the abandoned mineshaft, and indeed with the nether fortress, they still represent this beautiful little piece of, uh, you know, a link between these infinite series of worlds in a way that actually makes the game better. And what's even more fun about this is that each of these structures are deliberately built for a certain part of Minecraft's gameplay, and that means that there are some friendly structures there for you, but there's also lots of challenges that are baked into every single Minecraft world, and given that I recently uh, made a video about how to beat each of these, I actually have them all in one world, so how about we go through them individually and talk about what it is they really add. The stronghold was the first true adversarial structure added to Minecraft and it was made up of blocks that you wouldn't have seen at the time anywhere else and also consisted of basically a maze. This maze concept has been tried many times in Minecraft and it's a really fun one that I feel like we all have an instinct to make in our own worlds uh, but this is a true version of that maze because it's underground in a way that makes it very hard to circumvent. You can dig around this thing all you like but the most effective way to try and find the end portal is just to keep looking around it and seeing like okay is it up here? doesn't look like it is, we'll try round here instead. And the also great thing about this is that the whole place is filled with a trap at any time. If a silverfish happens to attack you, you will, and you attack it back without killing it in one hit, you will trigger all of the silverfish blocks nearby to break instantly, something which I don't think I need to tell you is bad. Similarly, I don't need to tell you why it's bad and why you definitely shouldn't break the blue block in a desert temple. It becomes very clear very quickly that the loot might be great, but this pressure plate isn't just set dressing and will lead to extreme craziness. Nine TNT is all it takes, by the way, to launch you around like that. It shows you the destructive power of TNT, the magic that is basic redstone, and also why you shouldn't trust any any time the game is just offering you free stuff. There's always a little bit of a catch in there that you should be keeping your eye out for. The jungle temple is of course very different. There are no traps in here. There's nothing you have to worry about. And even though my instinct is just to uh, do what I know 
that you've got to do, which is break a single block here and have access to this chest, which is handy, but also break another chest a block over here and have access to a second chest, which is just as handy in my opinion. Uh, but yeah, breaking just two blocks can give you access to everything in this structure. But if you don't do that, you'll walk in and you'll realize that, oh no, was that an arrow that just flew at my face? There are multiple traps in this place deliberately designed to catch you off guard. And I think the only thing that really shows the datedness of this place is the fact that it still shoots regular arrows rather than poison arrows. I'm just saying Minecraft could do with a little fix, I reckon. The witch hut is definitely the oddball of the batch. I mean, it's a very tiny structure, about six by six blocks, and there's nothing to really gain from it besides a crafting table, a black cat, and obviously, if you play bedrock, you get access to potions, which might be handy, I guess. But ultimately, yeah, getting access to a poison bottle that you can only drink is not that handy for most people, and instead this is used uh, for farming witches, something that they've been updating as recently as 1.21, uh, giving access to more redstone from witches, making you want to come to these places specifically to farm it without going underground. It's funny because the next structure added to Minecraft after the witch hut, which was intended to be truly, uh, you know, kind of gone up against, was actually the ocean monument, and boy is there a size difference here, but the reason for this size difference is that Jeff came back to his idea of trying to make a maze, and he had a clever idea as to how you could have an underwater maze without players just breaking through it, and that is apparently the reason he made the Elder Guardian, as he confirmed here. Which was a bigger and stronger version of the Guardians. <laughs> that also would give you this effect that made you break uh, blocks very, very slowly uh, to encourage you to actually go through the maze instead mm -hmm. of just digging through it. Unless you're playing in creative, you can't break the blocks to kill the Elder Guardians, which will stop you from breaking blocks. In other words, saying you have to do this entire Osha monument from underwater, where, by the way, there's no air. It is one of the beautiful challenges of Minecraft, and if you haven't faced one, you're missing out, let me tell you. The next structure that was added to Minecraft was one of the biggest we'd ever seen in history up until that point. Interestingly enough, this was actually one of the hardest to add structures. This was confirmed by Lady Agnes, who said... And back then, it was really, really tricky to do structures. We didn't oh, have yeah. like a good oh, system, yeah. so it's all it's hard-coded mm -hmm. and, and like to get everything together, like the code is, is a mess. Funnily enough, it was the process of trying to add this humongous structure to the game, which resulted in the structure block being added, which is why the game actually uses those to make this. Uh, it's something they've since improved upon, but yeah, the Woodland Mansion is huge and represents an experience of stepping into a giant build made by pillagers. This almost breaks the flow of Minecraft as being a world where you are the only one building things. You know, there are structures which are kind of challenges, but this isn't necessarily a challenge as much as it is a home of some very scary Illagers, which also we had confirmed from the same clip, were only added as part of a Minecraft Dungeons, uh, you know, like uh, basically trying to tie that game into Minecraft. And I think that's really fun to learn about. And the Woodland Mansion is also one of the most bizarre things to realize in modern day Minecraft, because if a desert temple is a link between worlds, this almost functions as the exact opposite. A world with a Woodland Mansion anywhere near spawn is inherently unique as a result of that. The Pillager Outpost is, of course, a much more reachable and accessible version of that. While the Bastion kind of went back to form for the Woodland Mansion, but in the Nether, and honestly, I think this structure works much better, not just because there are four separate variations, but also because of the fact that the Nether is much emptier. Finding a big cavernous rune like this with a very clear central objective, in the case of this one, there is so much gold and diamond and sometimes Neverite gear to be had, as well as the Neverite upgrade, right in the center here. You need to come to these things and the genius of 1.20 coming back in and making it the only place to get Neverite actually really, really tied this into something special. Pro tip, by the way, piglin brutes are terrible and uh, they don't like it when you open chests, so if you lock them into lava, you can guarantee they'll die. Also, pro tip, this is the only place where you'll find a magma cube spawner, so if you're really into frog lights, there's another reason to be here. There are so many reasons for a structure to exist right out of the gate now, which is really smart in my opinion, because even when they were uh, fairly featureless uh, affairs when they had one reason to be there. There was still a lot of thought that went into them. You've probably noticed that we skipped over the end structures, and that was for a reason, because I want to spend some time talking about the end city. These were of course added as part of the combat update, a famous update with nothing wrong to be said about it, and interestingly enough, there was so much thought that went into how these should exist, because they are the key feature of the Outer End Islands, and so when this was first revealed at Minecon 2015, Jib had this to say about it. The color scheme is more or less yellow, purple, and black. 
So I had uh, these new purple blocks and uh, that little creature. It's funny because the end looked so dark back then. They were clearly going for a never style feel rather than what we have today. Interestingly, if you play the Java edition, there is still an end fog, but only on the main island and only until you defeat the dragon. But also interestingly, uh, Jeb mentioned that there is some black in the color scheme of this place, but you'll notice it only in precisely one area, and that is on these banners right here, which is one of the very rare structures to actually incorporate those, which makes it very interesting on multiple levels, uh, to be fair. This was just after banners were added to the game. It, maybe they were thinking that they would fit everywhere else. But yeah, we have a purple, <laughs> yellow, and black structure that has precisely one area that it has any black. And it's an area where it shares it with purple anyway. But otherwise, this was one of the more revolutionary ideas because it was this kind of branching path. Rather than having a maze-like design, which Jeb had been obsessed with up until this point, the beautiful thing about the end city is how it is just a very clear fixed goal and an end point, which is the end ship, or at the very least, the very top of the city where some of the best loot can be found. Uh, but how you get there is up to you. Do you want to take the staircases or do you want to use the shulkers and let them knock you into the sky? It's a dangerous idea, but thank God I brought my potion of poison with me. That surely will help this go down a lot easier. Okay, I'm starting to think this was a poor decision. Speaking of poor decisions, um, there are lots of things to be said about the structures of Minecraft, but something you'll never hear anyone say is that they aren't something that majorly add to the value they get from the game, because this is something that really allows for the adventure aspect of Minecraft to flourish. Because as much as Minecraft is a survival game at its core, oh no, oh don't get me. Okay, we're fine. As much as Minecraft is a survival game at its core, really there are multiple playstyles that you can have, and this is one that fits into almost all of them, but like I said, every update has to cater for all sorts of players, and we could do a whole thing of these about blocks, so let's just be like, wow, they add blocks all the time, and there's there's like a hundred mobs now. You might think it's just cows, but there's like a dozen other friendly mobs, but I'd rather skip over those things and talk about something I am infused about, which would of course be... Freedom is a word that is thrown around a lot, but Minecraft is a game that truly represents it. Even the most open world of open world RPGs will have entirely non-optional segments. Skyrim forces you to escape a burning building and RuneScape has a tutorial island. And these are all there because the game developers think that putting users on a rail will really help them out. And although later, later versions of Minecraft had a tutorial, these were always optional and they weren't the go-to way for the game because instead Minecraft is a game that has both types of freedom taken very seriously because it drops you in a world and says do what you want. That means that you can make some really bad decisions. There is a freedom to do anything you want, including immediately dropping into a cave and getting murdered by zombies, jumping into lava and realizing that it hurts, or even just not really knowing what to do. You have full freedom to do whatever you want, but still at the same time, it offers you freedom from. It's a weird game to, you know, to have urgency in a game and to give the player a real sense of agency. You need to make sure that you are very careful in giving them uh, the nudges in the right direction. Minecraft doesn't do that. The world has all of the nudges and it's up to you to explore it. If you don't encounter an ancient city, then a warden won't come by and destroy you. If you don't encounter any creepers, then your base can't be destroyed. There are no natural disasters. There are no terrible things that will happen to your stuff. Anything that happens in your Minecraft world is entirely down to you. And so I think it beautifully encapsulates this freedom from and this freedom to at the exact same time. This isn't an accident, by the way, as many people might suggest, but in Instead, I think heavily represents the attitude of its founder. Notch has always believed that rich people were boring, and so when he got rich from the gaming industry, he uh, didn't uh, bat an eye at spending $150,000 on a single night of partying, or $70 million on an LA mansion. Uh, there are many other things that he has said in the attitude of freedom, but the point is to say uh, that I think that a very, very, very lavish, oh, overindulgent founder, weirdly enough, created a game that wasn't just, uh, you know, great and wasn't just the this uh, expression of freedom, but also was incredibly weird. 
this isn't an insult to the game, but is instead just me repeating what directly has been said by Christopher Zetterstrand, the artist for the game, and C418. When C418 was asked why he chose the music style he did, he says he liked how jarring it was. The design principle led to gasping voiced by his cat, the vertical pigs that explode when they get close, and cows that look like this. I think that the first time someone told you that you could place blocks in this order and make a portal to hell, just like me, you rolled your eyes a little bit, but then decided to do it anyway, and I think that we all remember the first time we went through it and were just jaw dropped by what we saw on the other side. Even though there wasn't much to the never the first time I went through, the fact that there was a dimension made of entirely different blocks blew me away, and the fact that there was another one to come yet made it even crazier. Minecraft is a game that rewards you for your exploration, and so this weirdness isn't an accident, but instead represents just how different the wit world can be. I think that the beauty of the weirdness comes from the freedom because you don't need to deal with too much of it if you don't want to. If the idea of having to learn to fight a dragon in a game that might be primarily about building sounds ridiculous to you, you don't have to go there and do it. Any update that comes out, unlike with many other games, aren't there to alter the progression fundamentally, but instead give you new options. There is a tech tree in Minecraft which used to be two-dimensional, used to go from one point to another point and then you had the diamond tools that were the best, but now with enchantments and neverite and all of these structures and all of these dimensions and places to go and things to do, you can now go from the start to the end, if there is such a thing in Minecraft, in whatever way you want and whatever goals you accomplish along the way are fun little bonuses. This is what I think makes the game beautiful, is that it's giving you freedom and using that freedom to encourage you to do some things you wouldn't have tried. Over the 12 years I've been playing Minecraft, I have done lots of very standard boring things, but I've also done lots of incredibly weird things I wouldn't have pictured when I first started playing it, and I don't even think I'm the most creative person that has come into contact with Minecraft. There are people that immediately made computers within months of Minecraft being out, and now you can, you don't bat an eye when you see something like Wordle fully functioned inside of it, and then you see stuff like, wow, there are entire communities of people making maps, and so if you want to play Pac-Man inside of Minecraft, it's possible, but then weirdly enough, something I only discovered quite recently was that Minecraft people are so passionate that they've started modding other games to be Minecraft, and so here is new Super Mario Bros for the DS, don't ask me why the DS version, modded to look like Minecraft. Why would you do it? I don't know, but I think it's so crazy beautiful. I've seen Mario Kart courses that look like the Minecraft, and we could do all of this all day forever. But my point is to say that Minecraft is an inspiration for so many, and I think the reason that it works is because of this hands-off attitude of, yeah, you can do whatever you want, you'll encounter some strange stuff, but then it's up to you what you do with it, and this is something I've always loved it for. But you know what else I've always loved about Minecraft? Uh, something I think will come as a surprise to no one is the player numbers in it. So... Most games that have multiplayer are designed for single player and then have the multiplayer tacked on later. I'm looking at you, Last of Us. Or sometimes there are games that are designed for multiplayer where there's a single player tacked on, like with the modern Call of Duty. However, Minecraft doesn't really fall into either camp because they seamlessly blend multiplayer and single player together. Looking at other games in the market, you can see that even within the bounds of a 2-8 to eight player game, usually the most fun is there to be had with a specific number of players within it. Take Catan for example, I love the the Settlers of Catan, but really it's a free or four player game. If you want to play with one or two, it's just not possible or feasible, and if you want to play with five or six, you'll need to upgrade your board, and also there's expansion packs, each of those expansions cost £50, and then you'll need another upgrade for each of those two, making it ludicrously expensive to have five or six friends, which means the game is actively profiting off you having that, and even if there's no charge, such as with multiplayer games, there's often a limit to your ability to play with those larger party sizes. Minecraft has no such concern, just hop right into the game. You don't need to worry about getting the right size group together to do what you want. If you want to play in a big multiplayer group, there's no limit to, oh, we have already have eight people. Uh, if you want to play by yourself because you just want to do it, there's no worry that, oh, well, I don't have a friend here, so how am I going to do this one feature? Everything in the game is accessible as single player, but also as multiplayer. And this is what leads to the thriving YouTube community for the game. The game can be watched in any of its forms by entire 
entirely different audiences. The younger audiences may prefer somebody role-playing as a character on an adventure with other characters playing uh, their own things. Teenagers may prefer a loud group of adults trying to emulate their peers, and adults might like to see the game as an extension of the creator's personality. These groups can segment even further by content, with some preferring builds, some preferring servers, and some preferring to see the weird side of the game, but we all share the game of Minecraft, and in that way, it's not even a 1 to 100 player game, but instead is a 300 million player game. We're all playing in the same world with the same experiences, be it of a plains biome that we're building something nice in, or a desert temple that we're raiding to try and get some extra loot, and I could try and explain what every single one of us is getting from the game, but the beauty is that actually we don't fully know. Everyone gets something different when they play Minecraft, but we all get something from it, and as an example, I asked people on Twitter what their favorite thing about Minecraft was, it's okay, this was in 2013, so it was it was still Twitter. I'm not I'm not gonna have to do the X, formerly known as Twitter thing here, uh, that everyone seems to do and acts like is a real way to refer to the site. But anyway, the interesting thing about what people like about Minecraft is how wildly different it is. So for example, uh, Gas Powered Pick likes exploration, and Madge Madden likes the fact that it doesn't end. This person loves playing with their husband in a brand new world when updates come out, and this person likes Redstone. Uh, this person likes that you can do anything in the game, and this person also likes that you can play Minecraft your way and there's no right or wrong way. This is what makes the game so beautiful, the number of different dimensions that people can enjoy the same basic features on, and while we're speaking of dimensions... Despite the hate that Minecraft and its developers can sometimes receive, ultimately it is the most successful game of all time, not just commercially, but also culturally. The fact that there are Simpsons gags about Minecraft, rather than the other way around, as it used to be, uh, kind of proves this beyond any point that I can raise in this video, but it's more successful than just its success in the cultural realm or commercial realm can prove, because obviously it is now owned by the most valuable company on earth, and obviously there are so many things things that are based on it now. When I was, you know, putting together a list of all the great things about Minecraft I wanted to talk about today, I had to skip huge sections about add-ons or about how it affected culture more broadly, or education even, because the education edition is huge, or even the fact that there are going to be animated series and a live action movie, there are going to be lots of people who know about Minecraft despite having never played it, which is impressive for a game that has reached a substantial percentage of the world's population already, uh, but this means it's going to define the culture for a while in a way that you might not be expecting if you still think of it as that goofy indie game. If you still think of it as the game that needs to uh, come to The Simpsons and ask for their permission, then you might be shocked to know that it's the other way around now, and I think that this is something I want to mention, and also I want to mention that Minecraft is a game that has reached me in a way that I never expected. This is a very, very special game that is so close to my heart in so many ways I couldn't properly explain, but one of the ways that I think I could is maybe to do with this. I think a lot of people have described being helped by Minecraft in a certain way. I would describe Minecraft as a game which has genuinely changed my perspective on the world more broadly. And outside of all the things I've mentioned in this video, there's one big axis, I would say, that divides the world. We talk about it in terms of politics all the time, as if people just randomly pick positions, but there are all sorts of entrenched, pre-existing things which will decide which way you lean. And I would say two of the big dimensions of the world are business and artists. I would say artists are very good at creating new things, but bad at maintaining them, while business people are very good at maintaining things, but are very bad at creating these concepts from scratch. And most of the world basically involves with these two people uh, actually trying to find a way that they can get along <laughs> more than anything else. Uh, but I would describe myself uh, as someone who was very good on one side of that, but really couldn't ever describe themselves as artistic. When I saw friends drawing, I just had no desire to do the same. I was always fascinated by the idea of making a game, but I never saw that, you know, and, and these sorts of, uh, you know, creative desires of, like, making uh, tracks within video games, but I never really saw anything beyond just like, yeah, I like games, and so that's a weird, uh, uh, you know, ex <laughs> extension of that more than anything else. But with Minecraft, I realized very early on, in the first year that I was playing, I made multiple downloadable maps. I recently found these because I was setting up some downloads for members, and I found my 2012 world downloads. I not only destroyed an entire uh, super flat world so that people could have a bedrock base to build on, but I also made several Hunger Games style maps. I made uh, challenges for other people to enjoy, and I spent a very, very long time hosting these publicly so that people could join them, because I love this idea of creating something that other people would enjoy. And 
I kind of just thought of this as being like, yeah, I, I like making Minecraft maps because I'm playing Minecraft. That's what the game is, right? But then I realized somewhere along the line that I'd been making daily videos for 10 years. And in the process of that, I started to, you know, these aren't just pieces of information that glob together. These started to become in their own way, creative projects. The things like this video have taken months to put together, but during it all, I have enjoyed the process and I've imagined how I could improve this here and put something there. And I've started to see an entire different side of my own personality. I think that I am not unique in seeing this. And I think that I just want to, uh, as one last kind of mention here today, say that Minecraft will help you realize some things about yourself, either by giving you some time to think. It has been there for me uh, during some bad times and just being a basic activity for me to play with my hands while I'm, you know, doing something in my head, either listening to a podcast or uh, just, you know, processing some stuff. But it's also a game which actively is not just sitting there casually, but actively challenging you in a way that I hope it continues to do for the future. I think that this is the greatest game ever, and if you watch this entire video and disagree, I, you know, I, I, don't, I don't, I don't believe you, honestly. But I, if you do, then uh, just type the word pineapple or use a pineapple emoji, and then uh, write your comment down below, and then look down below, and you'll see very few comments with pineapple emojis that don't say something positive, because that is the truth. This is the greatest game of all time, and there is no question about that. I hope after watching this video. Thank you so much for spending your time with it. Thank you for having watched this channel for so many years because it really has somehow, I would say, changed me or at least my perspective of me as a person. Maybe I was creative the entire time. Uh, that is the, the hard thing to prove really, isn't it? But you know what else is hard to prove? Uh, whether subscribing will actually help you see more videos, but you could do it anyway, I guess. Uh, or you could become a member and you can get access to those member-only world downloads uh, just for fun if you want. I could link one of my old Xbox 360 worlds down below. You won't be able to download it because it's a binary file for an Xbox 360, but if you want it, I could put that down there and then you could download a binary file that theoretically is a Minecraft world. That's a good idea, isn't it? Okay, thank you for watching. Hope you all enjoyed and uh, send some praise to my editor for putting this all together and I'll see you next time. Bye.